Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Madam Moore Cronin, and today we're discussing the future of impeachment. With us today is Hence the Future's in-house political correspondent, Brett Ewer. Brett, it's great to have you back on the pod, as always. Hey, good to be on again. Thanks. Awesome. Justin is away at the moment, but we are here to discuss a very important topic. You may have heard about it, which is impeachment. So there's a reason we're discussing this right now, and that's that the U.S. House of Representatives has just opened an impeachment inquiry into President Trump. And this follows the now famous whistleblower complaint from a CIA agent who expressed his urgent concern about a phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine. So before we get into predicting how this is going to play out, and how it was is going to impact Trump in the 2020 election, I think it'd be good to first just lay out the order of events. So Congress had voted to give Ukraine millions of dollars in aid and military support so that they can defend their new government regime against Russian aggression. Days before the call, Trump halted that aid. Then while on the call, Zelensky said, we are almost ready to buy more javelins for defense purposes. Javelins being the types of missiles that you, that the U.S. had promised Ukraine as military aid. Trump replied, quote, I would like you to do us a favor, though, and goes on to explain that he wants him to investigate Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, with potential improprieties regarding Hunter Biden's dealings with Ukraine. Later in the call, Zelensky said, quote, I also want to ensure you that we will be very serious about the case and will work on the investigation. So those are the order of events. Those are confirmed by the transcript that the White House itself released to the press. And I want to first just start with what's the most charitable interpretation of these events? That is tough to say. <laughs> I think the most, I think the most charitable interpretation, you know, from what I understand about the transcript, um, which you know I've read, uh, is that the transcript itself is a, uh, you know, they use it's more voice of a recognition. summary than a transcript too. Yeah, is that they have voice recognition software that gets the broad strokes, and then they have someone listening in who's filling in the details and adding a little bit more. Um, sentence structure <laughs> to mm-hmm. what Donald Trump's usual uh, speech is. And so, you know, I think a charitable way of looking at this is that the, uh, you know, what he said was, you know, his his discussing uh, any of the prosecutions or stuff could be just a non sequitur mm-hmm. uh, and that he's just kind of blathering on and talking about things that are generally relevant uh, to Ukraine and the U.S. Um, so, you know, I would say that's the most charitable interpretation. But I think that, you know, it's yeah. less likely that that's <laughs> right. Well, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about the what's the likely interpretation after. But I guess like just to stick on the charitable train, Trump has made a big deal about fighting corruption and draining the swamp. And that was a big part of his campaign. So you could see his defense as being look, Trump is fighting corruption on all levels, and that includes the potential corruption of political candidate Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden. And the president's responsibility in part is to protect the uh, sanctity of the elections. And, you know, and it may have had nothing to do with the fact that Trump wants to stay in power and Joe Biden is leading in the polls and is his biggest potential rival. Trump is just doing his job to combat corruption. And like you said, you could also see this being defended as a non sequitur, meaning, yeah, he brought up the Hunter Biden thing, but it wasn't necessarily a quid pro quo because Trump wanted to fight corruption on a variety of fronts. And uh, he, the reason for his withholding aid, which he has said, is that he wanted the other EU powers to put in more of their fair share And that was the reason he was withholding aid. He wasn't withholding aid so that Ukraine would investigate his political rival's son. Um, However, it seems like that is not, that doesn't seem to match up with the events because he, 
withheld aid, but then immediately afterwards, he approved the aid without the, the other European powers putting in more money. So you would think that if that was the real reason, well, it wasn't successful. And as soon as he got pressure and people, you know, the transcript came out and whatever, he just immediately allowed the aid to go through. So it doesn't seem like the most charitable interpretation of events is the same as the most likely interpretation of events. So I'm curious sure. to hear your thoughts on how do you interpret the events? You know, I, I want to add just another, you know, <laughs> it's strange that I'm offering a tidbit for the charitable side, but let's also keep in mind, you know, to your general point on corruption and, and foreign influence on an election, you know, President Obama did uh, convene, uh, you know, I think it was, it was both campaigns um, and, uh, and House and Senate leadership and said, hey, you know, just so you all know, we have some evidence that there's some foreign influence, particularly from Russia, uh, mm. and that Senator McConnell, Leader McConnell, threatened to go public with this information saying that President Obama was, was trying to uh, influence the election right. and you know, throw, throw his weight behind it. So, I mean, you could say that he is also trying to maybe prevent some right. sort of interference. Well, because Trump said something to the effect yeah. of, well, what if Biden gets elected and then he's in Ukraine's back pocket? And that seems sort of absurd to me. It's like just the power differential is just so massive that of like yeah. a Ukrainian versus a U.S. president that, I mean, I guess it's possible that there could be some like blackmail there, but it just seems like such a reach. Yeah. Yeah, that's just it's not very likely. And and it would be, frankly, I mean, it would be embarrassing if any president is under the thumb of any nation. But man, how embarrassing would it be if if. Uh, you know, if Joe Biden were elected president and then he's beholden to like Ukraine, really, right. of, of all like countries. New <laughs> president and yeah. Also, when you when you look at the Joe Biden incident that they're referring to, there was not a single Republican congressperson who spoke out against the firing of this prosecutor. So I guess just a little background on Hunter Biden. So there is a legitimate criticism of Joe Biden's son sort of getting the, you know, daddy's boy treatment where because you're the son of a powerful person, you get these, you know, really awesome consulting gigs where you get paid tons of money. And it's probably is partially because the people who are paying, you know, they'll have the ear of someone important in the U.S. government. Absolutely. But it's also worth noting that this is not some rare <laughs> like some some rare uh, phenomenon. I mean, look at Trump's kids. They are all benefiting from his presidency. Look at so m I mean, this is just how politics works. And it's not great. And it's like a it's sludgy. And it's you would hope that it didn't work that way. But it's not anything special to have a political, per, you know, a leader's son have this like cushy consulting gig with another foreign power or something like that. Yeah, you're right. It is it is not unusual. Um, that doesn't mean it's right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I agree with you and I can definitely vouch for it is that, you know, oftentimes people are brought on to boards of nonprofits or or for profit companies or, or anything to mm -hmm. uh, to influence and to, you know, move, you know, shift their political weight to the benefit of that entity that they're representing. Um, and that's how a lot of, you know, consultants and other uh, lobbyists who, you know, are in an agency or, you know, hang a shingle on their own. That's, you know, often one of the ways that they bring in business is their yeah. relationship and their close connection with, uh, with particular politicians. So yeah, there is the revolving know, door. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, part of a greater systemic corruption that we should address. So it's weird in this sense that, you know, if you're really for systemic change to make a, you know, an actual democracy or republic or, you know, a representative republic um, that's free of undue influence from vested interests, uh, you kind of almost come down on the side of Trump a little bit, at least yeah. in, in this instance. But that but that should just go to say that or, or, or it should, should it's it's evidence to the to the fact that there is systemic 
uh, yeah. there is a systemic problem. Well, I yeah. love to just look at the trajectory of John Boehner, who was Speaker of the House, very conservative, you know, anti-weed, anti-gay marriage, you know, all that stuff. But then as soon as he leaves the office, he then becomes a major lobbyist on the side of big marijuana companies. Yeah, he joined. A, he was he's part of the board of a, uh, I think it's one marijuana company, but he's a big advocate for it now. And I guess his personal politics are, you know, generally he doesn't really care what you do socially. Right, or, right. You know. um, he also likes to party. So I figure that kind of makes sense. He uh, he drinks a lot from what I've seen and smokes a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember going into the speaker's office like 2013 or something. I was I was giving a tour to constituents and just walking in and just having the wallpaper just seep smoke and tobacco right. smell. It was um but that's getting beside the point. Uh yeah, you know, people people join on these boards to uh to you know, to influence for the benefit of of the board uh, of, you know, the the entity that the board represents. Right. So I guess like what's what's specific here is one, it's the president, um, and that has a that has you know you should have a higher standard in, in that office it seems like, and also it may not be the first time that Trump has sought influence from a foreign government that will benefit him personally politically, so there was the call with Australia that just came to light, where. President Trump called the Prime Minister of Australia and requested that they investigate the Mueller report as a means of discrediting the Mueller report um, by finding out the origins of the report and that sort of thing. And so if you look at this from a, you know, as a position of being critical of Trump, you could say, well, this is just fits the pattern. He is using the office of the presidency for political gain. This is exactly what the founders were worried about. You're basically bringing in foreign governments to help secure your power in the U.S., which is supposed to be a democracy, you know, by the people, for the people. And that is terrible. And that may meet the qualifications of high crimes and misdemeanors. But you could also see on the other side, if you're a Trump supporter, how you know, maybe it's like, well, hey, the Mueller report was this big witch hunt and he was rightfully investigating the corruption that led to the start of this witch hunt, just like how he's investigating the corruption of Hunter Biden. So you can already see how both sides uh, would would spin this. And one thing that I've been absolutely surprised by is how objectively Fox News has covered it. I was not <laughs> expecting that. Yeah, there's only so much they can bend, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, you can spin, but not everything's a not everything's a spinny top. Um, you know, right. you have to. At some point, you do have to report uh, the facts of of the situation, and I think that's why, you know, if I can opine here, uh, I think that's probably why uh, Speaker Pelosi leapt on this one for impeachment. You know, I mm -hmm. think that there's a combination of political pressure it's been growing in her caucus for i mean so long now yeah there's that and they're just waiting for you know the perfect story because right. so much of politics is driven by narrative you know who has the better story that's that's what an election's all about that's what setting an agenda is all about you mm -hmm. have to get people to buy in and so this is a it seems to me a pretty clear cut instance where there's a, a, just a gross abuse of power for personal gain, which is terrifying. I'm sure mm -hmm. you can all, you know, I'm sure everyone would probably agree with that. Maybe not the National Review or the Federalist or whatever. But yeah. uh, well, Trump did just tweet a poll from Breitbart where it says, do you support impeachment? And it was like 98 percent. No. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, the people who read Breitbart, <laughs> I mean, it's just like shows a lack of statistical knowledge or <laughs> maybe intentional. But I mean, honestly, if I were the person coding that, I probably would have just not received the responses. I would have <laughs> just make a, you know, just have the poll just put out a random number because it's like, OK, they're already going to we already know that it's going to be, you know, 90 plus percent in favor. Um, right. But yeah, yeah I, I, really, I really like the point you made about how it's all about the story and which story people like better. 
Like I remember this one lawyer had a quote that he said, here's how it works. We tell our story, they tell their story, and the jury gets to decide which story they like better. And that's part of why this is the, this is the event that resulted in an impeachment inquiry is because this is a story that's fairly easy to follow. You know, you don't have to have all this knowledge of collusion and obstruction and all of these different meetings that took place in Trump Tower and who was there and who knew what. This is a story where there's a phone call, there's a transcript. Anyone who understands how, like basic negotiation or basic power games will understand that someone who has way more power is asking for someone with way less power to do us a favor and at the same time is withholding something the other person very much wants, millions of dollars in aid and military equipment. So and, it's, yeah. It, and it's especially, um, you know, emphasized. I mean, it's, it's the fact that Ukraine was so recently invaded. I mean, it was only five years ago mm -hmm. that there was a land invasion and another country seized territory from another. I mean, that's so uncommon right. now, you know, ever since the end of, you know, the Cold War, right? That you don't, we don't yeah, really the have end of colonialism. Seizures. And now we're doing land seizures again. It's like, it was just such a gross, uh, you know, instance of, of like a nation state acting in bad faith. I mean, acting poorly, acting, right. you know, that, uh, and then withholding weapons that could have prevented that it, it doesn't ring out well. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, those are good elements of, uh, you know, a story that would be necessary to impeach. Right. So I could also see though, that you could argue it on, you could argue that maybe it wasn't a national security threat because maybe they weren't withholding funds for that reason, or maybe the funds would have had no actual effect on national security. I've heard those, those points argued. So it's interesting to think about how these arguments are going to play out. And it might be good now just to get a sense for what is the impeachment process. And you know more about this than I do. So right now it's not actual impeachment, it's an impeachment inquiry. So what are the steps that need to happen for him to you know, actually be removed from office, if that's even you know, at all possible? Cool, yeah, so in the broad strokes, it is, um, you know, let's at least define impeachment. Impeachment is removal from office. So it's not conviction for a crime. You don't need necessarily well, to- Well, impeachment isn't necessarily removal. For, you can be impeached and acquitted. Oh, yes, yeah, it, the impeachment proceedings if they are taken to their fullest extent, either result in someone being removed from that office and barred from other high office of public trust or uh, acquittal, in mm -hmm. which case just the status quo remains. So, you know, now that we have that sort of basis, now that we have, you know, the, those fundamentals there, uh, what happens is there is there are proceedings, there are inquiries, and those can uh, you know, the, the origin of those can, you know, can be from a number of different uh, sources. So I think in the past, and I think in, in the present, these present proceedings, uh, the Judiciary Committee uh, looks into uh, the allegations. So they subpoena people, they hold hearings, they gather facts, and then uh, they, as committees do, issue a report. And the report will have recommendations and it will determine basic findings of fact. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know that for Bill Clinton's impeachment, it was there was a an independent investigation, an independent counsel, Ken Starr, who uh, was conducting an investigation for the Judiciary Committee. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can have a number of different players involved, but a lot of times it will go through the Judiciary Committee. And then they will issue a report and a recommendation and then impeachment. Uh, right. Those you know, are the votes. articles of impeachment. Right. And then and then impeachment votes take precedent on the on the floor. I mean, those are, you know, those rise above all other uh, you know, sort of motions or, or any other parliamentary, you know, all, all, uh, maneuvers. Right. Um, and it's just and, a simple majority that's needed in the House. Right. Yes, it's you can compare it in, you know, the, the criminal justice um, process. I think a, a good analog is uh, impeachment. You know, uh, uh, the impeachment proceedings are very much like a grand jury proceeding. 
Mm -hmm. So you have a prosecutor who is reviewing evidence and convincing uh, a grand jury uh, that they need to indict a particular person uh, for a crime. While in the House, it's that there is uh, a committee that's investigating and they uh, recommend um, you know, certain articles and then the House sort of acts as the jury, the grand jury in this case. And if they vote in favor of impeachment, then, well, impeachment then it goes to the Senate. Proceed. Yeah. Right. Uh, and right now, the Democrats do have a majority in the House. So it seems quite likely that Trump will be impeached. Now, whether he'll be removed or acquitted is another question because the Senate has a two thirds uh, or the Senate would need a two thirds majority in order to actually remove Trump from office. And right now, 53 of the 100 senators are Republican. So it seems very unlikely that Trump would be removed. I'm curious in your mind, what would need to happen for you know, public opinion to sway enough or something to happen that he could actually, you know, there would actually be that two thirds majority to remove him or at least compel him to resign if he thought maybe I will be removed. I'm going to tell you, I don't think he's going to be impeached and removed from office. Uh, I just, I think that there is enough political, you know, I think Republican senators are representing states where most of the people, you know, who are voting for them are receiving news from sources that will mm-hmm. discount it or downplay it. So the people that they're actually accountable to probably won't care. And most of the, you know, there are some people I've talked to in the city that say um, they actually have faith in the institutions and they think that senators will do the right and just thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, I really hope your your listeners disabuse <laughs> disabuse themselves <laughs> of that idea. Like it's not the West Wing, it's politics. It's mm-hmm. it, they're going to vote the party line. Now I wonder if there are a few ways that they might not. Um, one of those ways is maybe if there's a secret ballot hmm, that could interesting. That, I've never heard of that. I don't know if that's well. I, I did I did know that or I did hear that there's no official outline for how the proceedings need to take place. It's sort of like you invent it as it goes along. And, you know, since Mitch McConnell is the majority leader, it's probably going to be set up in a way that's very favorable to Trump and his defendants. But there's no real outline for what that process is. So it's it's feasible that they could do a secret ballot. And I actually saw a similar quote to you where if this was a secret ballot, 30 Republican senators would vote to impeach Trump, but they just would never want to answer to their voters and constituents. So it's not going to happen unless it is a secret ballot. Yeah. And I, that would be some political chicanery that would be really entertaining. And I would love to watch that. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, you know, that leader McConnell is setting up the proceedings and that they kind of just figure out, figure it out as they go along. Right. It could be Uh, one day like they could be, oh, great. The House impeached Trump. And then in the Senate, the very next day, Mitch McConnell's like, all right, all in favor. Oh, not enough. Okay, it's it's done. And then Trump could campaign in 2020 about how uh, another witch hunt, another partisan hit job came out against me and I was proven innocent, totally and completely exonerated. Like you could totally see that as a one likely scenario. I read I read a legal article that argued, uh, and I forget the author, but uh, that argued that the Senate actually doesn't need to, that the House can vote to impeach, and that the Senate itself has the discretion to not even take up proceedings, hmm. which seems. Yeah, I heard uh, about that uh, as a possibility, but a couple of days ago, Mitch McConnell said on air, yep. I would be obliged to bring this before the Senate the very day after the House impeached president. But he did make it like a side comment, like now how long that would take, you know, is another matter. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, he could run the vote, but it could happen immediately without, you know, any real hearings or any real public um, 
you know, song and dance, and it could just be like instantly acquitting him because they know they have the votes. Oh, absolutely. I imagine that if he tried to pull something like that, uh, there would be a flurry of lawsuits, uh, you know, uh, that would probably target, you know, whether there was actually due process given mm. um, to these proceedings. But but you are right. I mean, the guy clearly doesn't care about precedent. He didn't, you know, yeah. he, sto he stonewalled the Supreme Court nominee for a year. Um, and well, I'm curious that so given how much control Mitch McConnell and the Republicans have in the Senate, if you're a Democrat in the House, how do you play out the next few months? Do you basically try to drag out the impeachment proceedings for so that it impacts the 2020 election? Because I can't imagine they would want to just run through it and then let Trump get acquitted before 2020. Yes. So so, yes, you're exactly right. So think about it from the perspective of. Um, you know, any of the higher ups within the larger Democratic coalition. So that could be someone, you know, in leadership in the House or leadership in the Senate or even heck, even like the head of a major union. Right. Anyone mm -hmm. who's part of the, the larger coalition, um, what they'll want is, you know, they want they're viewing this most likely not as a constitutional duty to remove someone who is dangerous. They're viewing this through a political lens, uh, mm -hmm. primarily, I think. And so you really, you know, impeachment proceedings, I mean, the whole process should really drag on for as long as they can do it. And frankly, it would be amazing for them if, uh, if impeachment proceedings, whether that's in the House or in the Senate, uh, you know, if everything is not fully resolved uh, before next November, mm. because it is an incredibly powerful image to see Donald Trump either not out on the campaign trail and sitting in the Senate while everyone's surrounding him under trial, or it's an incredible image to see him out on the campaign trail uh, doing one of his famous rallies while there's you know, a split screen, him on one side doing these rallies and on the other side is an empty chair. I mean, that's quite a powerful image. And mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot, you know, does that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because the guy campaigned on draining the swamp, and right. differentiating himself and approval ratings for Congress and government in general are perennially dismal. Right. So, well, it's good in the sense that, like you told me when I texted you when I first learned of Trump's impeachment, this is good for riling up your base because it fits within Trump's whole narrative of being the victim and partisan hit jobs. And they were really just the Democrats really just couldn't bear the idea that they lost the 2016 election. And this is all just vengeance for that. And confirmation bias is a very powerful psychological tendency. So people who already think that way will fit it into their cognitive bias. The interesting X factor that I'm considering is what more could be uncovered? Could there be an even smokier smoking gun than what's already come out? Because it seems like there have been multiple times where Trump has asked a foreign leader to interfere he even, you know, Putin even put out a statement that basically we better not release their transcripts between Putin and Trump. So I'm wondering, because when you look at Nixon, for instance, Nixon was impeached, but it didn't look like he was going to be removed or have to resign until they found the tapes. And once they found the tapes that proved he himself directed the cover up of Watergate, that's when there was enough uh, enough opposition within his own party that he actually had to resign. So I'm curious if you think there could be any new revelation that would be enough to sway Republicans, you know, at least a third of them. Or do you think that's just so unlikely? It's tough. I mean, the, you know, I feel like the only and I, I'm, I'm saying this a little tongue in cheek, but but seriously, you know, the only thing within the Republican Party that I think is, you ever, have you ever heard of the phrase, Republicans fall in line, Democrats fall in love? Oh, Democrats, yeah, fall, yeah. They, Democrats fall in love with a candidate, you know, Obama, Bill Clinton, they fall in love, you know, they, they, they 
find someone and they just rave about them and that energizes them versus Republicans tend to, you know, they'll hate a candidate, but they're always going to vote for that candidate Mm -hmm. uh, for the Republican. And so, you know, it seems to me like the only more serious thing that that might bind that coalition together in a broad sense is like if uh, is is, um, you know, pro-life support, like if Donald Trump said something on, right. Uh, like That's interesting. If, if he said something on a call that was like, yeah, uh, you know, I totally like abortions. I think everyone should get an abortion. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, you that know, could be he, the nail in the coffin. Uh, but but I mean, I, you know, I say that kind of tongue in cheek. But seriously, I, I don't know if there is anything that would be more shocking that they'll reveal. I think plenty of people who are, you know, independents or Democrats will find more stuff and go, oh, this is revolting. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I don't think they're going to convince Republicans. Right. I think, you know, it's, it's really it really comes down to reaching people that don't normally pay attention to politics and showing them just how bad things have gotten. Um, right. You know, and then if there's electoral pressure from them on Republican uh you know, senators, then yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Now I'm curious if anyone else is at risk of being reprimanded besides Trump, because Trump might be protected because he's the president and there are certain rules about what you can and can't do with the president. But it seems like other people have been implicated. William Barr has been implicated. Rudy Giuliani has been implicated. Um, You know, Trump's own cabinet like they said, there was like a dozen people listening to his call. And after that call, they basically tried to make sure no copy of that call would see the light of day. And they put these documents into a private server that is supposed to house information that's sensitive for, you know, covert operations. And you don't want to, you know, out, you know, you don't want to out the spies that we have around the world. And he's basically just putting in the political favors that he's asking into that private server, which, if you recall, was a major phrase used against Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. So it's it's pretty remarkable, the parallels that we're seeing. But I'm curious if you think anyone else in Trump's orbit could be at jeopardy, even if Trump yeah. himself isn't. Yeah, absolutely, though. Again, you know, in telling the story, if you're going, you know, if you're trying to go after the big fish and then you miss the big fish, even if you get a smaller fish, it doesn't feel as good. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, think about how, you know, there was what during the Bush presidency, there was that whole issue with uh, the executive branch with I think it was Vice President Cheney outing a CIA agent, Valerie Plame. Mm. And then he kind of just brushed it off and Scooter Libby got the charges, uh, (laughs) Scooter Libby, his aide, um, you know, ultimately I believe he served time and then had his sentence commuted. But, um, but you know, it's, it's disappointing and it doesn't really tell a good story. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you come at the King, you best not miss, right? Like you have to, you know, uh, I'm sure that there are other people that could be implicated, but, but it would not serve, the political purposes purposes for which the I think the impeachment is actually being initiated. Right, right. Yeah. Now, I'm also curious about your thoughts on how this differs from previous impeachments, because there's not that many, you know, there's only three impeachments that have ever happened. There is President uh, Andrew Johnson was the first one, and that was basically because he improperly fired his defense secretary. There was Richard Nixon, which was probably, in my opinion, the worst ethically of all the impeachments, and he ended up actually getting removed. And then there was Bill Clinton, which was for the blowjob from Monica Lewinsky, that really it was mostly because he lied about it um, was, the big, was the big thing. So I'm curious if you see like, how you would fit Trump's uh, deeds within those other deeds, and if you think there's anything relevant as far as the cover-up is worse than the crime or if you think that in this new paradigm it's just like no you basically just never show signs of weakness and it's good to cover it up yeah i mean uh just to you know just to set the record straight on this richard nixon was not removed he did resign resigned right yeah yeah sorry just to 
just to, to keep that clear. But, um, you know, I don't know much about Andrew Johnson's impeachment. I know that he was pretty universally hated, um, but it's probably it's pretty hard to, you know, he's not a great follow up act to Lincoln. Um, right. So, you know, I'm going to disregard him for a second. But I think, you know, impeachment has because we have so few examples and so few precedents, I think that, uh, you know, it's been when it was invoked for Richard Nixon, it was a big deal. I mean, this was the second time that it ever happened for a president. Massive deal. And there was public, uh, you know, it seemed like the public was on the same page. There was a little less mm -hmm. division. I mean, yes, obviously you had, you know, the strife in the 60s and, and uh, you know, youth movements and, and you know, civil rights move. I mean, you know, you had a lot of division, certainly, but generally people had faith in their institutions uh, and they believed that, you know, there, there was a common set of ethics. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> you should, you like, you should. Well, there was only it. three TV channels. Everyone yeah. watched the same media. There was no like separate media for Republicans, separate media for liberals, like media yeah. silos. And what, and what's interesting is that for, you know, these out of the four, the latter two, the impeachment of Bill Clinton and the soon, the likely impeachment of Donald Trump, um, there's, you know, been a, like you say, a pretty distinct shift in the media landscape where you have media being sold. Media is not a public utility, you know? It's mm -hmm. not like we treat it like water, like it's something you need to have. It's a consumer good. And if I want to justify, you know, if I have an idea uh, that is more on, you know, if I want to justify Medicare for all, I can read Jacobin or current affairs or, you know, other left leaning magazines and, and be fully justified in my positions. If I want to read national review and, you know, not, you know, yeah. point being, point being is that, um, the public is fractured. And so, you know, impeachment is taking on a more political uh, role and less of a, you know, less of a, uh, it's less there to be a way to make sure that people are performing the office. And it's more of just a way to remove people if you don't like them. And, and frankly, I think the Republican party set that precedent in the nineties when they had an investigation about, yes, I mean, Bill Clinton, the charges I believe were obstruction of justice and perjury. Those aren't good and you shouldn't do them. But why was there an investigation about uh, his sex life anyway? It yeah. just seems... Well, it did kind of backfire on the Republicans at the time because they were sort of perceived as being obsessed with sex and not doing what was best for the country when Bill Clinton wanted to do all this stuff for Social Security and, and, and Medicaid. And so I'm curious if you think there's the possibility that it could backfire for the Democrats where it starts to seem like, hey, Trump's trying to do these actual things that are good for America. You guys are just obstructing it because you still can't get over the fact that you lost the 2016 election. Why can't you just do what's right for America? Like that could be another way it could backfire. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's all about the story. So, you know, if they if he in a sense, they, it could be used as a bargaining chip to make him come to the table and be more realistic on things like, you know, hey, we're going to have impeachment proceedings against you. And if you want to do this whole, oh, I'm trying to govern thing, well, then we'll just de make demand concessions of you in the legislation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they always talk about like this infrastructure bill that has never materialized. You know, the common areas between the Democrats and Donald Trump is that they want to invest in America. That should just be something that it's ridiculous that we even need to say that that is a common area <laughs> that you right, should invest right. in your country's infrastructure. It just seems like a, <laughs> that's like a no brainer. Yeah. Um, well, but, another interesting difference between Nixon, Clinton, Johnson, and Trump is that all of the three previous impeachments were when they were in their second term. So they only had, you know, months left, you know, before they were out of office anyways. Whereas with Trump, he's still in his first term and he still has an election right around the corner. So that is something that we've never seen before. So it's going to be fascinating to see how this impacts the 2020 election and 
how much it backfires on the Democrats versus effectively hurting Trump and strengthening other candidates like Joe Biden and, and whoever ends up being the nominee. You know, I wonder, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about electoral law to, to comment on this, but I wonder whether, you know, if Donald Trump were removed, you know, if there were some instance where, you know, you got 20 Republican senators to defect, um, you know, if you did get them to defect and to vote in favor of impeachment, I wonder how easy it would be to just swap in Mike Pence. As right. The, as I've the heard nominee. people suggest that and it never seems like like realistic seem. to me. No, I, I have a feeling that you have to like, you know, you have to get a lot of signatures to get on ballots in a bunch of different states. And it's probably, you know, there'd be a lot of paperwork that they would have to do very quickly. And that's not saying they don't have the infrastructure and the money to do it, but it seems like an unlikely course. Right. Right. Yeah. Another interesting trend in the polls, so it could change a lot, you know, it's very early, but it does seem like there is growing support for impeachment. So I'll cite a few polls. Last week, 50% of respondents in a Quinnipiac poll said they would not want, they do not support impeaching Trump. 37% 37% said they do support impeaching Trump. This week, 47% say don't impeach him. 47% say do impeach him. And that's the same Quinnipiac poll. Most recently, this was just, I think, this morning or last night, 45% no, 47% yes. So again, this is like the whole country. It's not specifically within Republican Party. But it does seem like there is growing support for at least an impeachment inquiry. Um, So it'll be interesting to see how these polls change over time and if any of the spins that the Republicans put out are going to be effective. And I find it hilarious that they actually sent their talking points, the Republicans sent their talking points to the Democrats, which is like... Uh as uh, Bill Maher said, it's like sending a dick pic to your mom. It's like a huge blunder. That was, what was that? That was last Tuesday, last uh-huh. Wednesday. I was, uh, I was playing a poker game uh, with a bunch of friends from the Hill that day. And they were all <laughs> talking about how just excellent that was. Uh, and I mean, how embarrassed, just how embarrassing is that? I yeah. forget her name. The, the, I mean, but she's, you know, in her late twenties or something. Oh, and man. that's, uh, that's going to follow her around for the rest of her life, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is why got to be careful when you have those list serves. Uh, always double check. Right. But, it really shows how the sausage gets made. It's like, I mean, when they talk about the talking heads, that's what they really are. They don't have their own opinions and their own thoughts. They're just parroting the talking points that they've been told. This is what you say, regardless of what the question is you say one of these points and you just drill it into people's heads and then they'll believe it if you say it enough times. Yeah. And it's about influencing the conversation and repeating sounds. I mean, like you say, drilling into heads, earworms, you know, things that you say dogs. Yeah, exactly. You say it enough. People just, it becomes part of the, the discussion. It's entered into the public record and it's, you know, it's a shout in the public forum. Um, but yeah, I mean, I frequently, when I would do media trainings for you know clients, uh, would frequently you know tell them to deploy tactics like flagging or pivoting, where you uh, come up with a you know if no matter what the question is, say well right. that's a really interesting point, but I'd really like to also emphasize something that ties into this, which is and then you know right or the uh, what Scott Adams talks about a lot is the high ground maneuver. So someone asks a specific question around, you know, how do you interpret this specific comment that was made on the phone call with the transcript? And then the respondent says, well, you're asking about all these low level things. I'm trying to do what's best for the American people. And what we really should do is fight corruption and infrastructure. And so that high ground maneuver is one of the most effective debate strategies. Um, And I mean, it's, it's interesting to see what some of the talking points are in that. So, you know, just a few that I'll I'll state. One is really focus on Hunter Biden. So whenever they talk about, you know, uh, Trump's impropriety, 
talk about Hunter Biden's impropriety. So there's an equivalency there. Also talk about how there is no quid pro quo and just drill that in over and over again. It's like the no collusion that Trump would tweet out like a million times. And then yep, the other was, one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, that, that was said. I remember reading that uh, multiple times after after the, the first, uh, you know, the when the transcript was leaked. I mean, that was what every Republican senator yeah. was saying. No, no, no quid pro quo. And it's like, right. OK, well, I guess you're boiling it down you're to that. You're saying no, kinda... you're not giving reasons, but I've heard it a lot. <laughs> yeah, and, sure. All right. And then the other one, which is actually, I think, the most nefarious of all of the talking points is to attack the credibility of the whistleblower himself, calling him a spy, calling him unpatriotic. And Trump even alluded to the fact that, hey, we used to deal with spies differently basically implying this guy should get killed <laughs> and you know obviously trump uses hyperbole and we don't i'm not saying he necessarily would actually kill him but the notion is out there and to think that this person could be a spy is absurd because if you're a spy and you're getting top secret information in the u.s government you're not going to blow the whistle and become the focus of this domestic you know huge domestic political and news event because your cover is going to be blown and you're not going to be able to get any more inside intel so it's clear this guy's not a spy but the fact that he's saying such seems very nefarious to me well everything's in bounds i mean it's politics yeah. like there's no, there's nothing that's right, really out right. of bounds um especially with donald trump i mean hell he can say whatever he wants um but yeah, the idea that the whistleblower is a spy is so ridiculous. The way I, at least I would respond is, why did you hire him then? Right. If you thought, if you thought this person was a spy, why were they placed? Are, is our counterintelligence not good enough? And if right. you, you know, Donald Trump tends to spar with the intelligence community quite a bit. Um, and, and sure, he might try to shift the blame onto them, but you can always say, why did you let them into the White House? I mean, right. why, why th this makes no sense. Uh, but, you know, everything's in bounds and they're going to say whatever they can to shift the conversation and at least buy time, uh, you know, before the media cycle covers something else, because that's, yeah. that's just how it works. Yeah, I'm particularly amazed that the whistleblower's complaint wouldn't have even come out if it hadn't been through the whistleblower process. So the New York Times reported that first, the CIA op operative put in a formal complaint that went to the White House, that went to the judiciary, and it was basically just squashed. You know, Barr and whoever else saw it was like, even though it says urgent, even though it clearly says this is not confidential, even though it very clearly lays out the order of events, they basically did not have it go any further. It was only because of the whistleblower process, which specifically has these protections where, you know, it must go to Congress and you must protect the identity of the whistleblower, that it actually came to light. And that's amazing to me because the whistleblower process hasn't been around that long and we may never have known about this. And the role of whistleblowers seems more important every every day as there are all these ways to safeguard information and, you know, stop things from getting out. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm glad that there is a whistleblower process and that it's clearly spelled out into law so that in, in statutes so that you can't just ignore, you know, mm -hmm. you can't just brush things under the rug. But but it only guarantees, from what I understand, it only guarantees that it will be brought before committees. Right. So the committees then need to ramp it up. And that's where, you know, you you deploy theater. I mean, political theater. That's the whole point of not the whole point of a committee hearing, I would hope. But uh, that's very often how it's used mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, it's a public forum for a, a politician or a member to, uh, you know, air, air what they think uh, and, you know, get some good questions in that shift the conversation one way or the other. Or uh, one of my favorite tactics in these hearings, I love it because it's just so obvious, is when uh, you know, the, let's say there's someone who's being brought up for a hearing to testify in front of a committee and they're being grilled by the majority party. 
you know, they're being just asked brutal questions. I love when the minority party or, or whoever it is, you know, whoever's on the side of the testifier, I love when they just use their entire five minutes of questioning to just talk and just say <laughs> nice things and just, right, let them, right. like, oh, just let them drink water or whatever, like they need to do to, <laughs> because it's brutal. I mean, it's brutal being, you know, one, you know, you're in a suit, it's probably hot in the building. Uh, you know, you're obvious, you're probably sweating cause it's nerve wracking. You have yeah. cameras all in front of you. You have people, you know, you right. every all. facial expression being analyzed, every clip being vetted for social media virality, everything. I mean, if you have your hands in a particular position by accident, people will read into that on Twitter, yeah. right? I mean, there was, who was it? There was someone who was flashing the, like the okay symbol, which is like oh, a yeah, sound, like, yeah. power symbol. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, that, I mean that Hillary is, Clinton went through how many hours in her email server hearings? It was like six hours or something of straight questioning. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a lot for anyone to go through. No, she was, she was a trooper. Uh, yeah. I mean, she really was six hours of questioning, but, but, you know, to the larger point, it's political theater and, and it comes down to the committees and whether they can justify further proceedings, you know, from whatever, from the fruit of the hearing, whatever they get from the hearing, you know, you need to use that to prime the pump again, to get more people interested in, in the issue at hand and keep it rolling, keep it rolling, mm -hmm. keep it you know, keep chewing up airtime, keep the focus on, you know, not on uh, whatever the president wants to do, but on the investigation itself. Right. And then, you know, once that works its way into enough people's heads, they'll just have a negative impression uh, of the president or of, you know, whoever the subject of the inquiry is. And then they'll, you know, maybe likely vote against them. I think right. that's kind of the, the strategy. Yeah. Now, I just have one more question, and then we sh can get into the future scenarios. And that is, given that the Republicans are likely not to impeach Trump, are there any risks that they run for future presidents if they don't impeach him now? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because this is not the optimal environment to impeach someone and remove them. But, you know, the, there is an argument to be made, which is that you can't, I mean, the things he's done are just, are just beyond the pale. I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of his, you know, there's a case to be made that he has uh, broken the emoluments clause in the constitution by, you know, directing, maybe not directing people, but having people, um, you know, come to his hotels and stay there rather yeah. than stay at another place or go to his golf. Yeah, poor Jimmy Carter had to give up his peanut farm and Trump is like, has all these real estate properties and foreign leaders. And it's, it's so silly. It's so silly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is an argument to be made that yes, it needs to, they need to set a precedent that this kind of behavior is unacceptable. The problem mm -hmm. is, is that it's just, it isn't going to go anywhere if, uh, you know, if there's no senators that are willing to to vote in favor of impeachment. I mean, right. it's just, you know, I sort of feel like it would be good if the precedent was that it it is a closed private vote. It just seems like that would be way better. Why does it need to be public? I mean, I guess I can see the argument in favor of it being public so that you couldn't, you know, you have to answer to your constituents and you're supposed to represent your constituents and that sort of thing. But it seems like it would be a far more honest assessment of the particular case of impeachment if it were done under closed doors. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's, you know, there's another argument to be made, which is that you should that it, it should be behind closed doors. Um, as we do with, you know, jury deliberations. But then you could right. also say, but I've I want my, I want to know what my elected representative is doing. Right, right. Uh, you know, so it's it's tricky. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't pretend to have the answers. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, with that, let's get into the future scenarios. All right, Brett. So, what do you think is the worst case scenario for the future of impeachment? Worst case scenario. Uh, I think the worst case scenario is that 
impeachment proceedings begin early and uh, and the House votes for impeachment before Thanksgiving and then it's brought to the Senate. And uh, I'm going to give you a twist here. The Senate votes to convict or to impeach Donald Trump. And my reasoning here is that Donald Trump is such a, an electoral liability, I think, even though he I mean, he has won in the past. I think it was kind of a fluke, but I would rather um, I would rather go up against him because he's been in office for the majority of his time uh, of, of his term. Um, I would rather go up against him than have give Mike Pence enough lead time to campaign and to establish himself as a credible national figure. That's terrifying to me because he's a smooth operator who can clearly get stuff done. He was in the house. He knows how this all works. Um, but I think that he were just fundamentally at odds on policy. It's kind of terrifying to think that that's interesting. In office. Yeah, he is a smooth operator, but he definitely lacks the charisma of Trump. So I wonder how much his uh, Trump's base would get behind him. That's true. But yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I part of my worst case also is that it goes too quickly, like the impeachment proceedings are just sort of rushed through and then Trump's able to be acquitted, you know, before 2020 and his base is even more strongly behind him. Mm. But on a higher level about impeachment in general, I would say the worst case scenario is that the bar gets set way lower for all future presidents. So we already know with former impeachment proceedings, like with Clinton, you can be president, get a blowjob from an intern, lie about it, and still be in office. Now, you could argue whether that should or shouldn't be the case, but that's the precedent that's been set. With Nixon, we've set the precedent that you can't direct spying of your opponent and actually put in listening equipment so that you can influence the election. You can't do that. That has been set. Now, yeah. the precedent that could be set if Trump is acquitted is that you can not only accept dirt from a foreign government to help you win an election, as which, which happened with Russia, you can also ask for dirt on a political rival to help you win an election from a foreign government. Those are very dangerous precedents. You could even argue that this is precisely what the founders were worried about when they decided on the rules of impeachment. I mean, they were worried about some, some president getting you know, really tight with Britain or France or some other country and then basically using their, the foreign, power, foreign government's power to secure their own power. So at a high level, I think that's the, the worst possible uh, scenario. But yeah, for Trump, I think it would be is that he's quickly acquitted by the Senate and then he just uses it as proof that, hey, it was another witch hunt. I won. I've been totally and completely exonerated. Yeah, that's terrifying. And, and it feel it, you know, it, it feeds into uh, it feeds into his story, which he had, which he sold remarkably well in 2016. It was an outsider's election and he was the outsider. Mm -hmm. Um it's interesting what you bring up. I mean, that that, you know, the frequency of impeachment proceedings has now ramped up so much so that I have a feeling that within our lifetimes, impeachment will just be considered a regular tool, like mm -hmm. on the table yeah. in the toolbox, something that if there is a slight disagreement uh, could be deployed. Mm -hmm. And it'll I, be an I, ever present I, threat, even if it's not. Always. Taken up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that. Uh, you know, the next few presidents that we see will probably face, if the opposing party is, uh, you know, in control of the House, will probably face impeachment proceedings. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we can see from the, you know, I think all of the investigations that happened during the Obama administration with the Republican House that yielded nothing, uh, you know, I think that there's, it's very clear you can see things ramping up. Mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. Okay, well, let's let's bring it around to the best case scenario. What do you think is the best case for the future of impeachment and the future of Trump in particular? Best case scenario. I think the best case would be for them to ramp up uh, impeachment proceedings and to you know, or not ramp up, actually drag them out. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, space the information, space the news so that it's still exciting and interesting and so that people can follow a clear development, a clear story that's unfolding. And then they need to bring that in at the very least into the general election. So, you know, past next August. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they need to have the proceedings uh, of the Senate take place during that time so that Donald Trump can't go out and campaign uh, so that he is stuck in D.C. having to deal with, you know, a constitutional, constitutionally mandated proceeding, mm -hmm. uh, and and he can't, you know, gin up his base. Um, you know, that's kind of a dangerous gambit there because it's possible that that could backfire and he could that could gin up his base if if they see him in the Senate stuck around all these senators. Uh, you know, it's that could be just the look he needs to. Um, to get you know his outsiders to uh, to mobilize, right. so you know I think that's but it's, I think it's still likely the best case scenario because you know even if your base is mobilized, there's still a vast sea of un, you know, untapped sea of voters and people that don't really pay attention to politics. I mean our you know participation rates in elections are dismal, mm -hmm. so uh, so reaching out to more people, um, you know via an impeachment proceeding uh, is potentially a viable strategy. Right. So that would be my best case scenario is that it would drag on for a long time. It would muddy up the election. It would make him look bad. And then it would give points to, you know, whoever's running against him. Yeah. Yeah. I have a similar best case where it does get dragged on, but not necessarily because they're dragging it on, but because there's, there's a lot more to find out. Uh, I mean, strategically, they should make it at least go beyond the 2020 election. But I guess what would also be in my best case is many of the wrongdoings come to light. So not only this conversation with Zelensky, not only the conversation with Australia, but I'd also be fascinated to learn about conversations with Putin and any other leaders that are relevant and that don't jeopardize our national security by making those public. And then I guess my best case scenario is actually I wouldn't even say that Trump is removed because it just seems so unlikely. It would be great if if, uh, you know, enough public opinion went on the side of, hey, this is wrong. We got to actually do something here that the Republicans did decide to remove him. But since I view that as so unlikely, I'm not even going to make that my best case. My mm -hmm. best case is that the American people decide in the 2020 election with additional information from these impeachment inquiries to choose a different candidate, to not choose Trump. And in my best case, I actually don't necessarily think it's a good look for Trump to be in jail. Like I'm not one of those like lock him up kind of people. I think yeah. you don't want your the pres a former president in jail. It's just not a good look. Also, that's not a good precedent for future presidents where it's like, hey, if you screw up, not only are we going to impeach you and remove you, but we're going to lock you away and throw away the key. Like that starts to look like a dictatorial system. And even if, if, even if he does deserve it and if he were, was a civilian, he would be put in jail. I still think it's not a good look for us internationally. So my best case is he's impeached. He's not removed. But in 2020, the people choose not to reelect him. And then he's basically, you know, falls to the wayside and at least some semblance of dignity has been restored to the office of the presidency and future presidents know that they can't seek dirt from foreign governments and get away with it. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about, you know, jailing or, or imprisoning, you know, or charging a president for, you know, once they've served their term for their actions taken during their term. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's a, two sides to it, maybe is that uh, one, it's not good because then you end up having everyone serve their term and then for some thing they're just, you know, the, the span of a president's activities are so great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's you so can great always find you, you fault. Can, of course, you'll probably be charged for anything. On the other hand, it might not, I mean, it might look like, you know, that it might strengthen and bolster the idea of the rule of law. Right, no one's um, above the law. No one's above the law. But, you know, we've seen how this happens in history. I mean, what, it was in the Roman Republic is when you were serving as a consul, you couldn't be 
tried for a crime and then you just ended up having a cartel of people that were wealthy and powerful who just always held office um, mm-hmm. and just never gave it up. I mean, I think that was actually the reason why that was why the Caesar crossed the Rubicon because he was originally coming down there because he, he needed to stand for consular election. Um, so yeah, you know, there are, there are aspects to this that are a little troubling, but yeah, I, uh, you know, I think that that would be a, the best case scenario is that people, you know, they restore dignity, uh, or we restore dignity to the office because Lord knows we need it. Yeah. Now let's get into the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. My favorite. Yeah. So what do you think, how do you think this is likely to play out if you were, to, if you were a betting man? I think what's going to happen is, you know, the House, Speaker Pelosi's already said that they're going to try to conclude proceedings by Thanksgiving, which I think is a mistake. But uh, they're going to conclude, then they're going to take care of some budget stuff, probably. They're going to recess at the end of the year. And then in January, they'll probably vote on impeachment in favor. And then uh, I think it will, you know, then it's kind of passed off to, to Leader McConnell. And I think, you know, like we covered earlier, I mean, it's kind of up to him on how to run it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he's he's shown that he's not afraid of breaking precedent before. So it's quite possible that he times it just right so that it lasts just up until uh, just before the conventions. And then he just, you know, has senators vote to acquit. And then they present a unified front and Trump can walk right. into the election or walk into the convention saying full acquittal. They got nothing on me, witch hunt. And I have a feeling yeah. that's probably what's going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, you never know what can what else is going to come up from investigations. There could be something really shocking. But if I were in charge, you know, in charge of the proceedings. And if I were Senate majority leader, that's probably how I'd play it because you want to have it span a long enough time so that there's at least the veneer of legitimacy. You know, mm-hmm. if you wanted to do it for just a day, I mean, I guess you could, but that seems ridiculous. Right, right. Have a, you know, a trial for just a day. I mean, come on. Um, but at the same time, the longer you drag it out, you know, the more potential political pressure those senators are exposed to. Right. The more Twitter snippets of really nicely timed and well said, you know, clips of Democratic senators could, uh, you know, sway public opinion, the more you allow them to speak. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I think the most likely scenario is that they're probably just going to ignore that. And the senators who are vulnerable, they might be given special dispensation to vote in favor of impeachment. You know, I could imagine mm-hmm. if a majority of the voters in Maine want Susan Collins to vote for an impeachment, she, she might do it. Uh, and, you know, it's up to the Senate majority leader to, well, it's up to the, the whip. Um, it's up to the majority whip to whip votes and count and figure out, you know, who they can retain and who they can lose. I have trouble thinking that there are going to be 20 defections, though. Mm-hmm. You now, know. how do you think in the most likely scenario, how do you think it's going to affect the Democratic nominees? Do you think this helps Biden, hurts Biden? Do you think they'd go for a more central candidate now? Or do you think it doesn't have much of an effect? I mean, I would hope that the people, you know, higher up in the party would realize that it's probably, you know, if, if they're going to uh, proceed with impeachment proceedings that that have <laughs> that have at their root, a call about potential corruption of the presidential candidate and his son, maybe try to choose someone else. Actually, I think that's that might be one of the points that uh, drives, you know, right now there's kind of a rift in the Democratic Party where you have, you know, the centrist, you know, establishment Democrats, and then you have this kind of in, insurgent left wing mm-hmm. rallied around Bernie Sa- or rallies around Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. And I think that you know, if they do uh, pursue impeachment proceedings and if those, you know, do carry on, that's probably a push or an impetus for them to um, 
to you know find a compromise candidate and coalesce around someone that unites both wings of those parties. So you know, kind of which would by, be uh, probably Yang. yeah, Yang Yang. <laughs> um, no, that would be really funny though. Um, great meme candidate. Uh, <laughs> No, it, it would probably, I mean, right now it would be Elizabeth Warren, but mm -hmm. you never know how someone pivots and, you know, claims right. different shares of the, you know, different wings of the party. Probably Elizabeth Warren. Um, but then again, there was news recently that a bunch of Wall Street Democrats. Right. Said, they said, we'll sit this one out if you guys elect Warren. <laughs> Very ominous. That's the deep state that the Republican media always talks about. Right. Well, partially. Well, maybe they'll, I don't know, maybe they'll... Um, choose you know booker or i have trouble thinking they'd choose harris but but yeah. probably you know booker or maybe uh Buddha judge yeah yeah interesting yeah i mean i unfortunately i agree with a lot of your most likely scenario i think he's going to be impeached by the house acquitted by the senate there's going to be a dog fight in 2020 i actually think it is going to be biden versus trump and I think it's going to further divide the country because you're going to just have these very vicious opinions on both sides. And it's really hard for me to say who's going to win if uh, if Trump will get reelected or not. Right now, it just feels like this is really harmful to Trump. It doesn't seem like he's playing, you know, 5D space chess like people talk about. It just seems like he's sort of floundering and he's tweeting 85 times a day and he's using like really odd grammar to try to distract people like little Adam Schiff misusing hyphens and even the dictionaries like hating on him. <laughs> it's like, so it's a pretty um, it's a pretty amazing place where we are right now as a country. And it's really hard to say where it'll go from here. If, I ha if you had to make me choose one way or the other, I'd say it probably is the most likely scenario that Trump gets reelected. Okay. But um, I think it's going to also harm him and it may actually create a backlash where maybe, the, maybe in the near future, the Republicans lose their majority in the Senate because people sort of start to wake up, at least enough people in, in different areas and... Um, yeah, so that's what I think is most likely. And I guess my, my hope in the most likely scenario is that even if he's not removed from office, he goes through enough grievance that it's clear that you can't just get away with this sort of thing. Even if you do get away with it in the end, it's just mm -hmm. not worth it. And people are not going to sit idly by if you try to get influence from a foreign government in, in a domestic election. So that's that's my assessment. Yeah, it is really important to establish that precedent, which is that his behavior is unacceptable. It's just such a shame that nothing will probably come from it. Um, yeah. But hey, you know, they still have time. I mean, they can drag things out and, uh, you know, continue through to the general. I mean, if they do that, then I think that they have a good chance of of, uh, you know, an electoral victory. But neither of us are in charge of that so right. I, I guess it's a way above our pay grade yeah and it'll be interesting to see how this impacts the next debate on the democratic side how much they talk about this versus the other stuff they've been talking about so that happens i believe it's on october 15th oh, so we'll, we'll probably do an update shortly after then if we you're if you're up for it yeah of course and always sure. Yeah, so until then, to our listeners, thank you guys for tuning in. This has been the future of impeachment, and we'll see you guys next time. what will inevitably happen. The past, the present, and the future.
Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.